Good afternoon. Won't you please join me in your Books of Common Prayer on page 103, where we will find an order of service for noonday. Let us begin together. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us say together Psalm 119. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. The Word of the Lord. Two days ago, we just celebrated the glory of Christ's resurrection. We came through Holy Week. We commemorated the Last Supper. We thought about the final commandment, to love one another as I have loved you, the greatest of the commandments. We reflected on the crucifixion, and we even entertained what it might be like the day before the Easter resurrection for those disciples who had, if you will, lost everything, or at least so they thought, Holy Saturday, if you will. And as I look back over all the many ways in which churches these days had produced something of a liturgy online, for those of us who are gathered in our homes during this unusual period in our global history, I observed that many of our worship communities and many of our faith leaders had opted to show pictures during the liturgy of the empty naves, the empty sanctuaries, pew after pew after pew. There was no one there. And there's been a little bit of a discussion throughout our different faith communities and our churches and parishes about whether or not this image of empty naves and empty sanctuaries is well, distressing to folks, because it's a reminder that we couldn't be together, at least physically, on Easter Sunday to celebrate the glorious resurrection, to celebrate it in the way we have done year after year after year, with all the beautiful pageantry, the wonderful music, the smells, the sights, the being together, the laughter, the hugging, the handshaking. We couldn't be together the way we have been together in the past. And so the very image of empty worship spaces can, in one sense, be, if you will, an instigator of distress. But I think if there's one thing that we have learned through this unusual period of time is that there is more than one lens by which to look upon the circumstances we currently face. And so when I see those empty naves, those empty worship spaces, over the last couple of days, I have been 
remembering a dear friend of mine who was one of my professors at Sewanee, Professor Don Arbenkraut, noted scholar of the history of the church. Don died several years ago, God rest his soul. But he was a wonderful, wonderful individual, a bright scholar. And when he came to preach at Sewanee, he'd step up in the pulpit. We couldn't wait to hear what Don would have to say. You see, at Sewanee, when you become a middler, your second year, one of the great hurdles that you get to cross is getting to preach to your fellow community. It's a big deal. The seminarians take it very seriously because in the rotation, we might get two sermons to be able to present in that one year alone. And so, like many seminarians, we would spend days and weeks preparing a sermon because in many ways, we're preaching to the choir. We're preaching to our fellow colleagues. We're preaching to professors. We've studied all of the, uh, if you will, devices of rhetoric by which to deliver a message. And we've studied all the commentaries. We've got all of our data and our information down pat. And, of course, we're a nervous wreck. So when the professors get up to preach, as they would do each afternoon for Community Eucharist, we always were looking forward to what they would have to say. On one particular occasion, Don Armantrout was scheduled to preach the Easter service. So this was bigger than the usual affair. The entire community with their spouses and children and all the professors, both current and retired, would show up for this occasion. And when we found out that Don Armantrout was going to be preaching, we really were looking forward to what he would have to say about the resurrection. Don was a funny man for his eccentricities, but his sense of humor was incredibly dry and very sarcastic. And most of the punchlines that he dropped on us in class really couldn't be shared appropriately outside of the classroom, not because they were inappropriate or offensive, but because they could be totally taken out of context. But his sense of humor and his dry wit made for something of a gruff comic relief. He was sort of like the angry man on the front porch, and we all understood that and loved him dearly for it. On this particular Easter Sunday, we waited. What was Don going to share with us? What golden wisdom was Don going to bestow upon us that we could understand the resurrection more profoundly than maybe we ever have before? Don only stood about five foot four, short fellow. The pulpit came up to his shoulders just about, so the image alone was rather humorous. Don got out of the pulpit, and as was his tendency, he always shifted his belt around his waist. He was always fidgeting with his pants. He got up in the pulpit. Everything was quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. And he looks out and he squints over his glasses and he looks at a community of 200 plus people. And he says, I don't know why you're here. He ain't here. He turns and he sits down. That was his Easter sermon. I don't know why you're here. He ain't here. We were dumbstruck. We'd never heard, first of all, a sermon that short. <laughs> and secondly, we were dumbstruck at just the sheer simplicity of the sermon. And then we were dumbstruck with the profundity of the sermon. I don't know why you're here. He's not here. We hear that in today's passage from Mark, the angel telling those who have come to the grave, who've come to the tomb to anoint the body with spices. He's not here. So now as I think back to those empty worship spaces that I saw in so many different live streams and so many different pre-recorded liturgies on Sunday, I think to myself, I don't find those to be an image of distress. When I think about Don Armand Trout's sermon, I actually think to myself, yes, in one sense, that's the way it ought to be. He's not here, and neither are we. The angel tells those who have visited the tomb to run back and tell the disciples and tell Peter, go to Galilee. That's where he will meet you. So the whole Easter resurrection event is predicated on Jesus no longer being where we expected to find him, followed with the commandment to go, an action verb, go. And I think to myself, what if we took that to heart 
as Christians who celebrate the resurrection in which everything has now changed. This is an unusual time. We've never experienced a Lent like we've just experienced. We've never experienced a Holy Week like what we've just experienced, much less an Easter like what we have just experienced. And those empty worship spaces, those empty sanctuaries, those empty naves, they can be looked at in another way. Jesus isn't here. He's gone on to a place where we have been called to go and to meet him and to make disciples of all the nations. So in one sense, it's very appropriate that those worship spaces are empty because Jesus isn't here. And neither are we. Do we believe what we profess in the creeds? Do we believe what we sing in the songs? Because when we take to heart what we say we believe, there's really no other choice but to follow, to go, to go to Galilee, to take the message of the risen Lord Jesus Christ into all the nations of the entire world. So that when we do gather again, it's to celebrate that resurrection, to give praise to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to proclaim to all the world that the resurrection happened, that our lives have changed, and that everything is now different. Amen. Christ is risen. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia, alleluia. Our liturgy continues on page 106 in your Books of Common Prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Let us pray. The Collect for Tuesday in Easter Week. O God, who by the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, destroyed death and brought life and immortality to light, grant that we, who have been raised with him, may abide in his presence and rejoice in the hope of eternal glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be dominion and praise forever and ever. Amen. Almighty Savior, who at noonday called your servant, St. Paul, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, we pray you to illumine the world with the radiance of your glory that all nations may come and worship you, for you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.